Alan Brosnan, from New Zealand SAS to leading tactical and breaching training in the USA, founder of TEAS, Tactical Energetic Entry Systems. A New Zealander based in the USA, just outside of Memphis, Tennessee, Alan shares his journey from the New Zealand SAS in the 1980s to establishing a specialised training school for high-end military and law enforcement personnel in the USA. With over four decades, literally read that again, four decades of experience in teaching and training in the US, he spoke about the niche focus of his company on professional tactical and breaching training for military, law enforcement and other government agencies. We spoke about the transition from New Zealand to the vastly different scale of operations in the US. Alan reflected on the continuous learning environment in America and his adaptation to the new training landscape, emphasising the importance of specialised skills and constant improvement. His experience with New Zealand SAS, which included both domestic and international missions, provided him with a unique perspective on special operations and the importance of advanced training methods that demanded precision, quick thinking and a deep understanding of tactical operations. After a distinguished career in New Zealand, Alan decided to leave for several reasons. He sought new challenges and wanted to leverage his expertise to make a broader impact on the field of tactical training. He saw an opportunity to fill a gap in the training of military and law enforcement personnel in the States, where he could apply his specialised knowledge to improve their operational capabilities. He has truly built a reputation for excellence and become a respected figure in the tactical training community there. Alan's dedication to his craft and his commitment to continuous improvement serve as a foundation for his company's success and, most importantly, the success of those he trains and that they get home to come home to their families. A great yarn with a true down-to-earth good Kiwi bloke and a professional operator, I hope you enjoy the show as much as I did. You can find Alan at the link below, energeticentry.com, or on Insta, uh, again the link is below, T-E-S underscore USA, T's USA. Thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former New Zealand Special Forces operator, subject matter expert from hownottodie.com.au. And you're listening to my Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast, sponsored by these guys, mystate.com, the ultimate daily formula for optimum hormone health, stress management, energy, and performance. 100% natural and clinically proven ingredients that provides everything you need to raise your game in a convenient, gut-friendly capsule. Links for my former shows are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast and welcome to my guest, finally a fellow Kiwi, but he's in USA, Alan Brosnan. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Damien. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to finally understand someone. You've got the right accent. You've got the right shirt. We've got the World Cup in four days. I'm uh, I'm feeling at ease. Exactly. So am I, but, you know, we never know, but I'll be up there and uh, screaming and yelling. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting times. My boy, actually, um, his, his mum's uh, South African, so I got a foot in both camps. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, uh, you know, good foe to have, uh, nonetheless. Yeah, looking forward to it. Man, you've got a hell of a background, and... Uh, and we, we've got a lot of people that we know in common. Yes, you're going from New Zealand SS over to USA. You know, um, and prior to this part of the show, I've done the intro, so people know your background and so on. But just in your words, I'd like to find out what it is you're doing now. Then I'm going to sort of go back and figure out how the hell you got there because it's it's quite the success you've had. And I often do say I interview the best people in the world at what they do, and I think you are uh, the world leader there. So what is it that you're doing now with? with your job, with your role and, and your and your company? Yeah, well, I started um, Tease um, in 1991 over here. I'm just outside or right on the edge of Memphis, Tennessee. And it was created to basically provide a, uh, you know, a platform for the high, high-end guys, SWAT guys, you know, military special operation guys, and, you know, gearing towards the hostage rescue, particularly the breaching, um, uh, you know, area there the breaching arena so we specialize in teaching all facets of breaching from mechanical all the way up to energetic and then we uh, also throw in the tactical side of it as well it's 
really interesting taking that to USA um, and what you, you've got out there on the social media and on the just showing what you do is, is absolutely brilliant, top of the line. But, you know, it's great to see the wall behind you, the memory wall, and we've got the shirts, but you've come from New Zealand. It's literally the next country is Antarctica. How did you end up making the decision to go to the United States? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It goes back really to the, the mid-'80s. Um, and just to be candid and honest with you, it came down to a political decision, you know, during the, you know, 87, 88 uh, time frame, the government was going through some difficult, um, you know, difficult period of time with the U.S. that made some decisions politically on which way they wanted to go. And I think you understand what I'm talking about there. Mm. And we had a, in the unit, we had a great relationship with our, our peer entities over here. We really enjoyed, you know, training with them. We we're working with them both here and abroad. And when that decision was made, um, I then decided, well, look, you know, I know I knew I was a Korea uh, SAS guy. I'd been told that. And I just said, well, look, if I if they can't come here, I'm going to look at going there. And I got an opportunity. I met an individual who lived over here in the States. He had a training company. He says, look, I'll bring you over. Here. We'll go through it the legal way through INS and we'll get you over here. And um uh, you know, and to see how it goes. So that's how it transpired right there. In 19, um, 1989, I made the decision and moved over here, and it's been 30, 34 years later. Wow. That's um, just really interests me how people can leave their town. You know, in New Zealand, we sort of go from the small town up to the big smoke of, of Wellington, Auckland. You know, you made it into the, 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 the big, um, the major leagues with getting into the unit, getting into New Zealand SAS. But then stepping to America is really, really out there. Um, it's it's the big leagues from from a little unit. What um, what was your business idea? Did you have a business idea, or was it just going to see what was was the opportunities and then taking it from there? What was the big picture? Well, when I got there, I was very, very grateful to get the opportunity, and um. I got the guy that sponsored me in over here. He had a, a sort of a, a split business. He had the training component, which trained law enforcement and military, which I'm thinking, how does that work? No, no civilians train our unit. And what do you mean you train military and and, uh, and police officers? So getting there and seeing how that worked was interesting. But then he had a split company, a DBA, and uh, it was for a, a, a billionaire movie producer of security contract. So it was a huge contract. It sounds a little weird, but we had a, basically a 42 man team looking after this family, both domestically and abroad. And uh, so that was full time. So that's what I gravitated into initially, the full time stuff. And then that was every now and again, we go away and, and do some training there. But it took a little bit, of, a little while. And I've been to America prior to that. Um, and the fact that I had traveled around the world, uh, you know, in different regions, you know, with the unit, with the army, uh, that helped a little bit there. But you're right, it was a massive step up and thinking that, well, in New Zealand, we have one police force, a national level police force. In America, there's about 19,000 different law enforcement entities. Wow. And then, of course, the last military um, that you have there and other government agencies. So it was like, how does this work? But then you realize when you get here that America is basically the hub for training. I think, you know, globally, it, it, everyone comes here for training. You know, you can access the subject matter experts, the rangers, there's weaponry, there's, there's ammunition, there's so forth there. So there's thousands of companies here that get into that arena of training. And I just didn't want to go out and start a shooting company. Uh, there was hundreds and hundreds of those and way, way better than me. We're talking professional level shooters here that are extremely good at what they do. So I wanted to get a, a niche market. And I says, what would that be? And then I thought about the breaching, which was a passion of mine, you know, back in the unit. And um, I enjoyed it and the tactics, of course. So I went for that. And, and Tease was the first uh, full-time school uh, in the United States to teach the breaching, um, you know, in the breaching arena there. Perfect answer. Thank you for um for getting. I don't think I asked that question as well as I could have, but you got me the answer, which is brilliant. So that transitions me to how was the skill sets you learned in little old New Zealand? And we know New Zealand SAS is is top of the line, but it's still super small. How was the skill sets you learned there in 
uh, counterterrorism, in um, in breaching, and all those things. Did, how did that slot into what you needed to do in USA, um, and also the close protection side? How did that um, fit in, or did you have to step up, upgrade, or or did you just slot in nicely? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I often you know talk about that over here with the Americans and so forth. But when I left the unit, I considered myself. Um, let's say, an above-average shooter, and I'm talking about now the black roll with the pistol, the MP5, and so forth there. But the only measuring stick we had was ourselves. Okay, All I knew was what you taught me. All you knew was what your sergeant taught you. And we became, even though the guys were skilled and, and of course, very competent, we were, um, <laughs> you sort of stuck into this little world there, and, it, and sometimes it became a little stagnant. There was no refreshing ideas or new ideas coming in. Whereas over here, I mean, there's conferences, there's companies, there's courses, there's you know symposiums you go to and you're learning every day. So when I got on the team there in Beverly Hills, um, every two weeks we had to go out and shoot as a group. So there was sort of two groups. We just flip flop. And I was out the range the first time I went out. And again, I had a Browning High Power that I, at that stage I borrowed from a, a friend over here. Um, and we're on the range, and I'm not kidding you. When I hear people say, well, I've been doing it five years. I'm locked in this way. Well, I've been doing it 10 years, 13 years. I mean, uh, I, I get sort of wound up a little bit when I hear that. So I got on the line, and we started shooting. And within about three minutes, I holstered my weapon. I stepped back off the line. I says, i got a lot to learn. I says, these guys, and we had... um. Of course, a lot of them were the police officers or retired uh, Marine Corps guys from Camp Pendleton. And I said, look at how these guys are doing it. Look at how they're doing their draw. Look at how they're changing their mags and doing combat reloads. Look at how they're doing A, B, and C. And I says, I have got to get better. I thought I was at that level, and compared to these guys, I was here. So I stepped back, and I just watched. I went home. I studied it. I went out and shot as much as I could and realized there was a life after us, you know. And and just every every week working with these guys and going out and competing on weekends, I says I've got to raise the bar here. If you're going to instruct and teach this to Americans, absolutely. It's interesting you say that, Alan. I I um I caught up with an old um a group uh, colleague, I'll say the other day, and um, he actually worked with the Australians a lot um, for for quite many years. And same sort of thing. And it, what I got from that was the operational tempo is so high. You know, Australians working with the Americans, Australians having so many operations all the time. And compared to New Zealand, it just raised you up again and again and again through through need. Um, also, it was refreshing to hear you uh, have and and utilize one of those tenets of human humility, because we tend to get in that. Um, purple circle as they call it here in Australia and but in New Zealand um that you know you're only surrounded by people that um it becomes a bit of an echo chamber if you will but when you suddenly go overseas and see other other people at a much different level you you do have to have the humility to say right I've got um uh more to learn I've got space to grow rather than than resting on your laurels no that's exactly right and uh and I think you know particularly if you're going to be an instructor there's you know, there's ways of doing things in New Zealand, Australia, United Kingdom, America, Southeast Asia, wherever you go, there's a certain ways that they might function. But fundamentals and core skills never change. You know, how we handle the weapon or whatever, how you ride a motorbike, there's core skills. So you've got to establish them. Uh, then after that, it's just a matter of pushing yourself and competing. And it's a bit like, I mean, it's no different than the rugby. You've got your tier one teams and your tier two. And the only way tier two teams are going to get better is by playing tier one teams. So you don't become a better tennis player or golfer unless you play someone better than you. So I started going out and competing a lot, knowing that I'm never going to be up in the very top echelon. But when you're um, you know, competing against these really master shooters, it tends to raise the bar and lift you as it would in any sport, I believe. Yeah, brilliant. Now, going on to the breaching side of things, that's another um, thing I've got uh, with New Zealand. We tend to hold those secrets so tight. Then we realise everyone in the world is doing the same sort of thing. And uh, it's, as you said, available to, I think you said, 17,000 different police agencies. 
So it's not really so secret, but, and it's a bit of a loaded question, it is really protected in New Zealand SES as the breaching. And I, I was head of our, our method of entry cell for some time. Um, what was it like for you career-wise going to present that to other agencies? Was that a, a quite a big uh, decision you had to make? Well, I, I got, I mean, I got the blessing off some, some people, some, some good people in the unit and, uh, and they actually put the New Zealand police, a special tax group on to me and said, look, we, we would love to help you. However, and they says, but hey, try this guy, call this guy. He lives in the States. And that was about, you know, where it came. But when I got here, it's a little different, Damien. You've got, you know, essentially 750,000, you know, cops and of course a million plus, you know, military here. And these guys, particularly the law enforcement guys are operational every day, 24 seven. They're out doing stuff every single day. It's, uh, as you know, it uh, can be, a little bit violent over here in certain areas and uh, so forth. So these are the people that need the skills. So yeah. I had no, there was no qualms you know, on my side. There was no decision making. These people need life-saving skills. They need to know how to, to shoot, you know, to be tactically aware and sound. They need to be able to know how to breach. If they can't breach, how can they get in and do their task? So I had no issues there at all. I mean, what what we're teaching is just, you know, just basic skills. And then how you apply that is up to you and your ingenuity and so forth there. So no, I would never hold back. Um, you know, remembering in New Zealand, there was at that stage, there was one unit doing it, which which was the, you know, the military. And of yep. course, then at branch 95, I went back and stood up the STG, the Special Tactics Group, or ATS probably as it was called back then, and started up their breaching program, as I did with the seven Australian states and the federal police because they're the guys that need it, they're doing it every day. Whereas in the military, you tend to train, 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 operate. Well, the police were opposite. They were operational, you know, so busy, they never got a chance to train to rectify issues they encountered during operations. So it's a really balancing act right there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, over here now, the police are doing it every day. They're very competent, as are the New Zealand and Australian you know, police uh, entities there because they've put a lot of hard work into it. And they, they have that need, as you said. I'm really interested in that. I was a police officer for a couple of years here, uh, and I believe you became a reserve officer or you became a, a, a police officer there as well? Yeah, that I did that back in... Um, I didn't know about this program until I moved out here to Mississippi, and they, they have what's called in the sheriff departments here, and some of the police departments, they have what's called reserve officers, or in my case, reserve deputies. So uh, I found out about this program, and it was critically important to me. This was one of the things that I, I had to do, because I came here to train U.S. law enforcement, but I'm a foreigner with a military background. So what do I know about U.S. law enforcement? So I went down and knocked on the door, and the sheriff. I had a meeting with the sheriff and his senior staff, and um, and and he said to me, uh, so we've got something you want. And he sort of slid this sheriff's badge across the table. I says, uh, yes, sir. I said, I'd be uh, honored, you know, to be part of this entity here and learn more about what you do. And he says, well, in fact, uh, we've got something you want and you've got something we want. You've got a range, you've got, you know, and capabilities and knowledge. And we just happen to be Restanding up our SWAT team that he disbanded for a little bit, and they were using the Memphis guys to cover for this county. Yeah, so it was perfect timing, and that was 1992, and I did about I think till about 2015. So, uh, and all I did was the, the SWAT side of it. The I didn't do any patrolling or investigations. I just responded as every guy did to the page you go on off back in those days and all the SWAT calls. And being on the southern edge of Memphis, it was a, it's a very busy county here. And uh, so that gave me a very clear understanding of how they operate. And we're talking the 90s here. So we're yeah. talking extreme lack of funding, lack of equipment, lack of training. But these guys are going out, you know, all the time, sometimes, you know, two or three hits a night. And and it's just a lot of it is luck, you know. We all had a good night tonight. It was luck, but I could see they needed the bar needed to be raised, and we uh, you know, developed into a very very good and well respected SWAT team, which back then was twelve. Now it's about twenty eight, I believe. And um, 
that they're doing very well. So that that was important to me to get a better understanding of how I designed the training for these US law enforcement officers and their tempo and how they operate and so forth. I'm really interested, um, you said the luck, you know, as a police officer, the criminals aren't out there. It's not like you see on TV, they're not criminal masterminds. They're basically just scumbags and, and, and low rent sort of individuals, but there is that, that bad guy out there that does have some skill. And um, I'm thinking the time from you're in, I'm thinking back to the bank robbery with the guys with the AK-47s and, and the body armor, you know, that changed the game uh, a lot. And to have someone with your caliber thinking here, when these guys are operating at the threat level here, they're thinking of your, what you're designing and what you're, you're aiming towards would really stand them in a good stead. So you must have really instituted and seen a change through those, those that era? Oh, without a doubt, there. Yeah. I mean, it, it raised the bar, and what it did, it, it gave until you're, you know, basically shown something, you think, oh, that's a different arena. I never knew that. But these people are smart, so they start gravitating, you know, into that new zone, wherever it may be. Mm. And it's uh, interesting you mentioned about the North Hollywood Bank shootout, and this is a uh, something I raise a lot with the students here. If you remember um, when that occurred, there was a squad car came down the road. And there were three LAPD SWAT officers in it. And then they got ambushed by one of the brothers. He was behind that little truck he had taken and he was lighting them up with his AK there. Well, the guy in the back seat of that car is a very good friend of mine. And um, when I had my school down in Brazil, I actually took him down to Brazil. And this was shortly after this incident. And uh, I says, would you like to come down and do a presentation? This thing was a global, I mean, it was known globally. And I said, uh, it's very fresh in everyone's mind. And I remember him getting up on stage there. And there were several hundred Brazilian officers in the audience here. And he says, hey, my name is so-and-so. And it's an honor to be here with you guys. And he had that, that photo, that backdrop photo of the North American bank and then the, the guys in their body armor, head to toe and all that. He said, well, that occurred, you know, we were in the gym working out. We got the call. We were in our shorts, our PT shoes. We jumped in the cars. We were told to bring our rifles, not our MP5s because of the ballistic protection. And he says, when we came down that street, we came under fire. And I remember him saying, and he, he played the video, then he froze it. And he said to these Brazilian police officers, the only reason I am standing here alive today is because of training. He said, when we came under fire, we never had one split second to think what to do. We did what we were trained to do. And you let that sink in. And we know that. We understand that clearly. Okay. You will, you, you will go back to your, your level of training there. And he said it twice. And they're sitting there going, yeah, he is right. They said, we didn't say, we didn't wait for our team leader to go, right, you do this and I'll do that. They'd be dead. They did what they were trained to do. So training is huge over here. It's a massive industry because the operational tempo, these guys clearly understand that without training, they're going to be, you know, coming second. It's amazing as a police officer. And I think about it so often, especially with what I do now, you know, titled How Not to Die. You know, I the last thing I thought about as a police officer and last thing I would think about as anybody's family as a police officer is going to work and not not coming back, you know, dying, uh, uh, ambulance uh, officer, same thing. Firemen, you know, the stuff we do, we go to job, it's pretty life-threatening most of the jobs. But a cop, you know, they can go from a traffic stop, the guy has literally not stopped at a stop sign, to you're getting shot at. And it's, it's just a crazy world we live in, but we see it so much there in America. And you're so right. At that time, you, you've done so many traffic stops that night, you're not expecting the gunfight, but you have to react. And the only way you react is how you've trained um, or whatever files you can access in your brain. You can't step up past that. So what you do is amazing. And it's really cool to see that you've got there in the trenches and found out what it is they need. And then backed up by what that guy said, because he didn't think. He just did what finally accessed in his brain. I've, I've seen this before. I've done this before. I just need to react to that, that, that action with this drill. Yeah, that, that is exactly right there. And he he's a, you know, he's a one of the upper echelon departments. And but it, I think a lot of it goes back to your, you know, your middle management, your, you know, your administrators. Uh, and over here, I'm talking about, you know, are they 
Are they funding the training and the maintenance of your program? So, you know, getting to a certain level in any skill set is just a start. You've got to maintain that program there. And that then obviously goes back to the, you know, your, your upper echelon there. Will they support training and pay for the training and so forth? But here, there's so much pressure. There's peer pressure because you are measured against your peer entities. If something goes wrong in an operation, well, heck, they have this, why don't you? And they yeah. do this, why don't you? So it's really, really good. You know, in the last you know 32 years, just seeing the, you know, the the escalation and the the massive increase in training and how important training is to any discipline, uh, it, it's just very, very pleasing. And they understand that for a small amount of dollars, the reward could be massive. And we're talking about saving lives. It is about that. Um, I remember talking to Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. I was lucky enough to chat to him. I think last year, really interesting um, what, what he's done with the law enforcement side. But uh, just to sort of tie a bow in the law enforcement, the general policing side of things, you know, I was a highly trained counter-terrorist operator as a police officer here in Western Australia. Um, there's the TRG here, the tactical team that, that you were probably um, part of, of, of standing up. The person that's going to probably have to pull the trigger, put their finger on the trigger, is the cop on the ground. And I can say that, exactly here proven uh, there was a hostage uh taking uh situation a, a guy with a knife to a woman's throat surrounded by seven uniformed police officers swat team let's just call it that generically you know hours away minutes away these people had to do it and one of them had to take the shot and mm -hmm. alan this will probably scare you western australian police they fire two magazines per year for retraining mm. And they yeah, have to take a shot to save a person's life. That, that's why they did it, to protect life and property. They had to uh, shoot the, the bad guy um, to save that woman's life. And that was an under-trained, under-practiced, under-practiced uh, uh, person um, that, as you say, just for a small amount of outlay uh, and dollars of some more rounds, some more training and expert training them, uh, he'd be much more confident in doing that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I also, just speaking of Australia, there was the incident in Melbourne there just the other year with the um, the, the terrorists, let's call them the terrorists. Oh, the was, Lint siege, you mean? No, no, that was Sydney. I'm talking about in Melbourne, there was a um, a guy with a knife in the street and he was stabbing people and all that. Yes. And the first responder there was a young, uh, a young police officer not long out of the academy, and he took care of it. So, yeah, they are the first responders, your patrolmen, your general duties officers, and so forth there. So training is important. I mean, we're all human. I mean, we all have the ability to learn. It's about has that switch been turned on, and are you given that opportunity there? Otherwise, how do we get to where we are? We were taught. And because we may have come from, you know, uh, you know, a high level unit, we got more training, but everyone needs to have training. And that person on the street, that first responder, you know, be it medical, fire or law enforcement is going to be the one that makes or breaks it, you know, these active shooter situations and so forth. So over the last few years, a huge amount, a huge effort has gone in to training. I don't know a department that doesn't do it, but every patrol officer, as we call them here, is trained in active shooter, you know, basic structure clearance, and it's just been elevated so lot. And that little bit of knowledge goes a long way. Hey, if my partner goes left, I have to go right. You know, just basic stuff that until you're told, you don't really get a grasp of there. So everyone has the ability to be educated. It's up to the bosses to allow that to happen. I absolutely agree. Actually, and on that, you know, we talked about the active shooter in Auckland, uh, I think it was about two months ago. I wrote an article on that um, on that uh, case. You know, it was really good to see the res response from New Zealand police. Yes, they were only, their base is only four blocks away from that place, but so different compared to, and I remember live as Ara Moana. You know, mm -hmm. you had one police officer with a revolver, I think, at that time. It was a very different level of uh, training and also was available. And it was a, a pretty good outcome. You know, they saved a lot of lives by being so quick and so able to respond in an appropriate way to that. Yeah, and I think that's just a credit to the mindset of our law enforcement officers. You know, they understand they understand their roles and tasks. They're there to, you know, protect the public and so forth. We understand that. But at the same time, they can't do that if they're laying down on a pool of blood, their own blood. They can't do that if they make a silly mistake or cross an open door or go into a room on their own or whatever it may be there. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, you know, they've, they've got to be smart and they are smart these days here and they've got to have that education and that and that development just comes from training from, again, playing someone who's a little better than you that will make you a better, you know, sportsman right there. So I think administrators have finally realised it. We understand there, of course, we're hamstrung with money, you know, and it's every department, Every entity has money. It's how that money is disseminated within that organization. How much goes to training versus new desks and new computers and new squad cars and so forth there. So it's there. They just got to, um, you know, fund it correctly. Well, that transitions me on to, I actually did write a couple of questions down before the show. I normally just go with an angle, but I've got a couple of questions. And I was wondering how how you went through that, um, I don't know what we're calling it now, but through that that 2020, 2021, 2022, when we're not supposed to be near each other and mask up. How did you go through that period with your business? Because you can't transition to online like Tony Blower did. Uh, yours is hands-on, literally. So how did that go for you? I'm, I'm quite intrigued, and I'm sure everybody, all the listeners would be that are in that sort of um, business as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, speaking of Tony, great, great friend. Saw him at Shop Show last year. We we sort of keep in touch, but we, we go back decades. Him and I, we actually worked together for several years there. But anyway, um, I was when COVID happened. Um, I was back in New Zealand working with the STG down in Christchurch, and from there it was very early March of what was it, two thousand twenty, when it, whenever it was. It was yep. you know it was. It was March the 1st or 2nd, and I flew straight to Afghanistan. I had to go over there to Kabul. And I was in Kabul, and it was, I think, March the 13th when the pandemic was declared. And I said to my friend, I was there with Dave. I says, mate, I said, i got to get home. I said, I don't mind getting stuck in Dubai. I'd love to get back to the States, but I don't want to get stuck in Kabul. Because mm. no one actually knew what was going on except airlines would be closing down. So I got out. I got home. And it was um, up to about, that was March. So everything here, it closed down, everything. So the companies closed. And the good thing that the government did here is they, they had the assistance for companies where you could keep your employees on and they, you know, you could still pay your employees, but everything was closed down. But I'll tell you one thing here, the importance of training, um, you know, within the law enforcement community, uh, not so much military because they are a government entity. They're controlled by the federal government. But law enforcement are controlled by their states or, or their, their, their local administrations. So yeah. you have federal, state, and local law enforcement there. And, of course, state and local being the vast majority. And the following year, 2020, so 2020 was pretty much a wash. Yeah. 2021... And I don't know how this happened, but we had the busiest year in the 30 years of T's history. 2022 was busier. And I'm thinking, how can this happen? And I figured it out. People said, screw it. We got to keep training. We understand the extreme value of training. It saves lives. We've got to keep doing it. And we had so many people come in, you know, two courses a week, definitely week after week. And um, it's just continued since then. So that, is a, to me, is a credit to the administrations to say, look, we can't just become stagnant. We've got people we've got to save out there, including ourselves. We need to go and train. So, so if someone gets the flu, they don't go to training. And we just got to do it. Someone gets sick. And I understand to a lot of people that might be not a nice way of putting it, but the value of training cannot be underestimated in any discipline. That's really that's good to see. It. It's all, it's almost like, and I'm putting the business head on a little bit here, they they got a chance to to pause for a second and and work on the business, not in the business. And I'm saying business in air quotes. It's almost as if they got to have a, a, a bit of reflection on what was going on and realize they needed that training. It is. It's a, it's a, a huge part of what they do. Now, I'm not talking, you know, if you're a patrol officer or maybe in investigations, but the SWAT guys, the tactical guys out there, they have an ever-evolving um, arena they're in there. I mean, like you said before, the bad guys train just like us. They train hard. They may not be as skilled. They may not be as accurate and, and disciplined, but they do train. So you've got to keep up with that or they start getting ahead there. So, yeah, it was a credit to the bosses to say, hey, let's just keep pushing this along. And, uh, and I think it, I think in hindsight, it was the right move for them because of their role they're in. 
I'm going to ask you a question soon about the different method of entry that you're sort of pioneering or at least bringing to um, the mainstream. But I'd like to go back a little bit. And I wanted to ask Bill Bestick. I don't know if you know uh, Bill Bestick. Yeah, yeah. And of course, his, his, his dad, uh, uh, probably more so, you know, uh, in his role. But yes, I've, I've heard a lot. I've heard a lot about him. Yes, definitely. So Dr. Bill Bestick, now for the listeners, he was a, a New Zealand SAS operator. He's gone on to be a doctor, then an anesthetist. But he did a show and it was a great show. And it was basically, uh, he had to relearn how to talk to civilians because coming out of the New Zealand SAS is very different communication. Now, you've had to do that with A, Americans, and B, uh, they're not military guys. Yeah, they talk the language of, of SWAT and so on. But how did you go with your communication style? Because um, you seem very open, you seem very um, or, um, very easy to speak to, Alan. But how did you go changing your, your communication style from New Zealand SAS to America and, and the uh, the people you had to go into business with? Yeah, that, that's that's a good question because you've got to speak the language and you've got to be able to converse with them in a way they understand. And they're not going to bend towards me. I've got to, you know, gravitate into the way they think and do things and express things and so forth. So it was just um, a matter of, you know, forcing yourself to to change, you know, and that came through definitely being on the SWAT team. I learned their language, the way they do things, you know, terminology and so forth there. And I remember we all speak English, you know, we, and then for us, it was the Queen's English, for them it's American and America is everything. You know, there's, not, there's nothing else, right? And America is the world. So I understood that. So I had to raise my bar and speak their terminology, understand their tactics, understand the way they thought, and most definitely understand the administrative oversight there, because that's what governs everything. So I had to learn about, well, what are they being told and what are their left and right limits there? So that's just um, something I had to do. I can't say, well, I want to be a New Zealander for the next 30 years and make them gravitate to me. No, I got to go to them. And it's the same in my school in Brazil. That was an amazing experience there about when we first went there and we said, right, we're here. You know, us Americans are here to teach you. They says, no, 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 it's different here. You know, the way we work in the favelas and the slums and you've got to gravitate to us. So the way we did that, uh, and I was so grateful to get the opportunity that every free night we had, we would go out on operations with them. And I'm talking about, dressed up, ready to go, one of them. And we go into the slums every night and work the shifts there. And it was an amazing experience, but it gave us the knowledge to then come back and redesign the train to suit their roles and tasks. So again, if you're going to go overseas and work with an entity, you need to gravitate to their way of doing things. And what you have is good sound you know, fundamentals. We, we have that. And then you just got to be able to you know, then turn that around and incorporate it into the way they operate. And that worked well. It's, you know, I think of the term reading the room. I was very lucky to interview Todd Fox from Tour Protection a few weeks ago. What a nice guy. And for the listeners, this guy, his background as a US Marine, crayon chewing, as we said in the, in the show, we're having a laugh, because this guy that was presented to me that I was, I was chatting with and interviewing was not a crane chewing uh, gung-ho marine. He was a person who would um, speak to Christina Aguilera and all the other, all the fancy um, hobnobbing there. And he said, you know, you couldn't even look these people in the eyes. You had to speak to them completely differently. And you just read that room to, to get the outcome, which his job was to protect them. But you can't make them bend to your will. You've got to sort of massage it uh, in communicative ways and get to get the right outcome. And that sounds exactly what you did in, in, uh, in Brazil. Yeah, no, it is. And it's, um, I think it's, a, you know, we, we know that, um, you know, people look at certain nations or nationalities as, as leaders. But when you go to their country, okay, we're the visitor there. Okay, we're, we're the odd one out. And you've got to look at them. And of course, their respect is always there, particularly in Brazil, extremely dangerous and violent place. Uh, you know, shootings every night. It's like, holy smokes, these guys come out every night and do this. I mean, yeah. it was an amazing experience here. But yeah, you've got to have the humility, I guess, to, to just go back and just say, right, I'm the, I'm here, I'm the visitor. How can I help these guys? And that's 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 how we, we did it anyway. Brilliant. 
thank you for that. That's something I really wanted to <clears throat> to tease it. <laughs> I didn't even mean that. Oh God, that's a dad joke. I didn't want to tease it out of you anyway. Um, going on to what you're doing now with the method of entry uh, stuff that I've been seeing, uh, Broco Torch and Hydraulic. Um, and as a firefighter, method of entry really um, intrigues me because, you know, our thing was you got shotgun, you got charges, but if it all failed, crash and bash. And, and what that meant was the, the, the Halligan bar, the, the sledgehammer, and that never failed. When I joined the fire brigade, uh, Alan, all they had was an axe. There was no, no, not even a Halligan bar here. It was crazy. Um, never kicked a door in until I joined the fire brigade. <laughs> that wasn't a good outcome either. So you've got the hydraulic gear and, and the broker torch. Um, that seems to have evolved a lot. Is that the, just talk us through how that's used uh, and, and what you're teaching and so on versus say just straight up explosive entry or, or shotgun. Yeah, I think the, the tools now um, and methods of entry are of course vastly different to probably when I started doing it there. Well, maybe not vastly different. Maybe we've just got a better handle and appreciation and understanding of it right now. But um, we teach all disciplines of breaching here from just your basic rams and pries and halogens and you know, all the way up to advanced energetic stuff. But when I look at it, and I, one of the courses we run, it's called Mechanical, Thermal, Ballistic and Power Tool. And it's that very hands-on course. And I just say to all the law enforcement guys, you know, out of all our courses, this is the most important one because it's what you use 99% of the time. It's not energetic products. It's not explosive breaching. You're using these tools 99% of the time. you got to get really good at these tools right here. One of the biggest tools on the move right now, or the, the, the biggest um, uh, method of entry would be hydraulics. Mm. And I remember way back in my day in the unit, oh, that one stayed in the closet because it wasn't dynamic. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't, you know, because everything back then was go, go, go. And uh, but that tool, we we are very strong supporters of a, a company called Sand. They're out of Israel. They have a, a, an amazing um, you know hydraulic tool that we use at the range with a facility that's been designed for it. In fact, we've got a course starting tomorrow, and there's three different countries coming over here to do the course. And it's uh, these hydraulic tools now have a, 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 an amazing amount of power, what they can do, whether it's to cut, to push, to pull, to spread or whatever, as you know, in the fire service there. But uh, that's that's something that guys want to use. It's very quiet. It allows them to get in a little more surreptitiously if they have to move forward to a, a crisis site and so forth. But your thermal is another one. And you say, well, we'll never use that. Well, what about when you're in your county jail and every county here, all 3,280 of them have a jail and you've got, you know, a lot of bars and iron and metal and so forth, maybe we have to use that. So you think, yeah, that's a good point. It's a fair point right there. And you can't use energetics to confine space, the overpressure and so forth. So there is a place for every tool. And that's why you can't just push that one aside. You've got to be competent with all of these tools as a breacher there. And um, that's something we try and foster a lot. We try and get that well-rounded breacher who could do a target analysis of a, a, a site they're going to do it. Maybe they're doing a high-risk arrest warrant for a murderer tomorrow night, and they get to look and analyze that target and go, can I do it with A, B, C, D, E, or F? And, of course, it's a force continuum, and you present it to your bosses in that respect. Right? You don't just go, let's go blow the door. You've got to justify why you're doing that. So, yeah, the, the other tools are very important and your ability to be able to manage them and use them correctly obviously comes along with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's so clever. Um, you know, I love that, that that quote, you know, if all you have is a hammer, all you see is a bunch of nails. Um, the, the hydraulic gear is great. I mean, we, obviously, we use the, for the people out there that call it the jaws of life or use hydraulic tools and those spreaders are so amazing we've now got electric ones uh, i believe on some of the stations it just makes it man packable and, and, and portable and just so many nice options there as well yeah for sure yeah the, the electric ones now are the way to go um without a doubt i mean creating you know anything from you know seven to 15 tons of pressure and of course we can't even fathom that but the tool no. speaks for itself it does, uh, yeah. Nothing's going to, everything's going to get out of the way of those of those jaws. Look, that's amazing. Um, to to find out the background and just really, um, almost humbling to to hear how you've used that humility and that um, 
uh, not going in, the, in an overbearing way to the new country to, to saying, this is the way we do it. And you've, you've had such great success. So I remember hearing about Tease when I first got into the unit and it's great to watch what you've done. Um, what are you currently doing and what's the direction for Tease now, Helen? Well, it's you know it's been it's been a long time. It's been sort of over three decades now. But in say you know my age, you know now I've got my grandkids and I just they only live five minutes away. And I love you know seeing them and they come around here a lot and stay a lot. But you know you've got to think about you know your, the next part of your life and all that. And as much as you say, well, I'd love to retire and put my feet up. It's so busy now. And the the thing is, uh, Damien and. I'm sure you're the same. It's the passion you have for something. And even though I've been doing it a long time and I have brilliant instructors, I have a great car drive. These are guys I trust with my company. They travel all over the country or you know overseas and they teach for me. And, uh, and it's important we have that, that, you know, that, that trust and that um, respect for each other there. But you know, would I like to put my feet up and slow down? Yeah, I would, but I still love this so much. It's hard to do that. You know, it's something that uh, we start our International Breaching Symposium this weekend. I'm going, <laughs> oh, I don't want to do another one of these, all the organizing and all that. But when you have, you know, anything from 12 to 19 countries that come to this event every year, you go, well, how do I stop? You know, if I said this, we're not going to do it again, you know, I'd be getting booze and, and bottles thrown at me. But and it's the same with work. I said, as much as I'd like to slow down, I just can't because we're so, so busy right now. And it's a, a different, like in, in our line of work. And when you teach your defensive tactics and all that, you're teaching life-saving skills to people. It's not that you're the plumber or the carpenter or whatever. And if you stop, it's one thing. But with us, it, because we've been doing it so long, you feel you have a duty to just keep going. And I, I wish I didn't often feel like that, but that's just the nature of the business. It really is. I'm glad that we we touched on that point, Alan, because I was in Dunedin the other day. I was back in New Zealand and uh, I popped in to see Jeff Todd, our, yeah. our instructor for many, many years in, in the unit. And um, yeah, just the passions there. And it's almost as if, you know, it's very cliche, but, you know, if you love what you do, it's not work. It's not a job. It's, it's just what you do. And I, I am passionate about teaching people those life-saving skills, but Jeff, gosh, you know, he's been doing it all his life, same as you have with what you're doing with teas, and and it's just it's just a passion, and it comes through. So it's great to have you on. I've sort of had in, in a week, I've had two subject matter experts that um just love what they do and and uh, are doing it to help others for no other reason. Yeah, that that that's it. I think that's the that's the end state right there. It's a, it's a very dangerous you know business we're in it's a dangerous and violent world out there unfortunately it's only going to get worse as we've seen over the you know the, the decades and that and no one's slowing down so I, you know I don't, I don't know I just there are there are other great companies out there and you know we we have friends within the industry and we support each other as the breaching symposium does it fosters you know great relationships there but I, I still enjoy doing it. I love teaching, the, the passion. Look at Tony, you know, Tony Blau. I mean, him and I are probably similar ages, but he's out there sort of still getting on the mat and so forth. So it's something that if you feel you have, you know, the ability to still, you know, have input, then I believe that input's important. It really, really is. Thank you for what you do, uh, Ellen. I've got to say that. Uh, it's in the show notes at the start of it, and I don't think you need uh, the promotion, but if people have got to this stage and they want to find out where to find out more about you, where do they go and what's the best best resource? Well, our, our website, of course, and the social media, uh, energeticentry.com. That's the easiest way to go to get an overview of, of what we do and, and about the company and so forth there. Um, and then Instagram and, and Facebook were on there. The company's on there. We have you know quite good following. So that that's I don't know a lot about that. I have good people that, that do that, but that's how most people will access it there, if not word of mouth. It's a very small you know industry in what we do. So of course it gets gets around quicker there. But uh, they would probably be the most the easiest ways. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, this reminds me of a show, one of my favorite shows that I did. It wasn't the most popular. It's definitely one of my most favorite with uh, Daniel Winkler of Winkler Knives. And I, I told her that a, a renaissance uh, uh, gentleman, he's a, a master master bladesmith who made knives for SEAL Team 6 and, and Delta and a lot of the different guys. And 
It's been the same with you, Ellen. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and, and sharing a bit of your story. I just want to, again, thank you for what you did and, and thank you for, for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, Damien. It's a pleasure. I, I love following your show. You've had such a vast array of individuals, you know, from all different arenas. And I'm sort of amazed at uh, who you've had on there and how you access them. But certainly it's, uh, it's, it's good listening. Uh, it's a 30 five minute drive to the range for me each day and that's when I do all my listening so keep up what you're doing mate and uh, all the very best oh that means a lot it really really does thank you Alan and uh and go the ABs on uh, on Saturday yeah, yeah for sure mate okay <laughs> I agree. Awesome. Thanks I'll hit pause and we'll, I'll hit pause and we'll have right. a quick chat thank you okay and we hi thanks for watching I'm Damien Porter former special forces operator and check out my new project for 2023 at hownottodie.com.au where I've combined all my special forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching.